Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Katz. Um, so I am so excited to have all of you here today because I am exceptionally proud because I am introducing my wife, Rose Katz. Uh, Many of you know Rose and I, um, and we are a ceramic materials nerd couple. Um, all we do is study materials, um, but Rose specifically came out of the, uh, the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University um, with her BFA. She has worked as a production potter. Um, she's been there in the trenches with all of you, um, but she also transitioned into working in industry. She spent many years as a glaze designer in the tile industry and has moved through various uh, different tile companies through the years, um, really sort of being a woman in charge, um, running with materials as a subject of her passion. And um, she and I have taken that to creating an educational company all about materials where we work together, we raise our two boys together, and we nerd out about materials. Um, so Rose is gonna present to you her research on the chemistry of the colorants. Uh, and uh, I welcome, and I'm so excited to say, welcome Rose Katz. Okay, so this is the first time I'm presenting. Can everybody hear me? Wonderful. So I'm gonna take a picture of all of you because my kids won't won't realize how big I had to do this in front of. And this is my first time presenting, so I'm a little nervous, so sorry if my voice wavers or I go too fast. But it is being recorded, so you will be able to see it. And if you have any questions, please feel free. You come up to the microphone or come see me afterwards. So welcome to our talk, Color Forms, Understanding the Role of Colorants in Glaze Chemistry. And I'm Rose Katz of Ceramic Materials Workshop, and I'm so pleased to be here at Inseca, Minneapolis. So before we start, I want to do thank yous because they tend to get buried at the bottom. And uh, this was a real group effort. Ceramic Materials Workshop is a series of online study, and a lot of work goes into this. Um, and we're helped by all of our students all over the world. So, we just want to say thank you to some people whose names you'll see come up through the talk. Of course, my partner and husband, Matthew Katz. Our research associates, T.C. Stanton, who is in the room, I believe. Um, Alex Sims, Jesse Jones, as well as some of our students, Grant Akiyama, Kara Matos, Veronica Montavon, Vanessa Azone, Daniel Bendy, Lisa Zolins, Nick Waddell, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your names. <laughs> um, Brett Mosier, Christina Rhodes, Luke Verhoft, Derek Au, and Kiyoshi Kaneshiro, all of which have done work to help us understand what we do better. Now, to understand how colorants work in glaze chemistry, we have to talk about how glaze chemistry really works. Of course, it starts with a formula. So here's a very basic glaze formula, and this one's called 4321. And it's pretty much the simplest cone 10 glaze you can make. It makes a very nice glossy glaze at cone 10, and we'll take a look at it in a second. This is everything a glaze needs to be functional at cone 10. It provides four basic base ingredients that we'll talk about here in a second. And the formula is written like this. We have nepheline cyanide at 40%, Whiting at 20%, flint at 30%, EPK at 10%, and cobalt carbonate at 1%. Now, if you go out into the world and you look at websites like glazy.org, you'll find a lot of glaze formulas written like this. Some of them are more complex, some are less complex, but this is the basic format for almost all glaze formulas that you'll see in the world. But, we need to take a little deeper look to understand what's going on inside of this glaze. A glaze formula is generally showing us the ingredients that contribute to the underlying chemistry of a glaze. These materials fall into four really important groups. One is a feldspar, 
In this glaze, we have nepheline cyanide, which is providing our feldspar needs for this glaze. Two is whiting, it's an alkali earth flux. And we'll talk about that, what that means in just a minute. Uh, three is our silica in the form of flint, as we call it in the States. Four, and the last one, is clay. Clay is not just a thing we use in bodies, but clay is actually a mineral, or clay, or kaolin. The interesting thing is if you take these four base ingredients, that nepheline cyanide, that whiting, flint, and EPK, all together, this formula, they equal 100. And it's important because those are the materials that make up the actual glaze. When we're looking at a glaze, we're looking at these four materials. They're interacting together to make that glaze. But the formula doesn't end there because this particular formula we have, we have cobalt carbonate at 1%. And cobalt carbonate is the colorant. Colorants are always treated as extra. And in fact, if we actually look at the math on this formula, it's not correct because 40 plus 20 plus 30 plus 10 plus 1 equals 101%. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Can't have more than 100% of anything. So we just go with it, the assumption that we'll have 101% of this glaze. Now, let's talk a little bit more about chemistry, my favorite subject. We're gonna talk about what's making this glaze work. We have all these ingredients, these four major ingredients, and they actually break down into smaller groups. The nepheline cyanide and the whiting function as fluxes. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but we need to look at our, our glass forming group, which is in the blue here. We have flint and EPK. Those are our glass formers. We see glaze, they're just glass. But the problem with the glass formers, they naturally melt at incredibly high temperatures. We traditionally consider cone 10 to be hot. Well, silica, melts at cone 32, and alumina melts at cone 42. So <clears throat> when we come, we're going to go back to these nepheline cyanide and the whiting. We use these two fluxes, in the case nepheline cyanide and whiting, to bring down the melting temperatures of these glass formers. So we have fluxes and we have glass formers. Those make up the glaze itself. So each individual material is bringing in a specific type of element, but the colorant's often treated as extra. And historically, if you ask what the contribution of a colorant is in a glaze, you'd be told it makes the color, which is true. In this case, the cobalt carbonate is making a glaze blue, but if you've worked with colorants at all, that you know a lot of colorants will flux glazes a little bit more than when you don't have that flux or that color in the glaze. So it's, uh, sorry, I just lost my place here. Um, so you know it's pretty common that happens with some colorants. Other colorants like chrome oxide, which we'll take a look, about, a look at in a little bit, it actually hurts the fluxing. They're called refractory or anti-fluxes. We end up with the question of, are these colorants playing a role in the chemistry or are they just making a color? So they should, should they be included in the base formula or should they be excluded like the way they are now? So to fill in a little bit more background on the basic glaze chemistry, this is a periodic table by one of the ceramic engineering professors um, at, at Alfred University named Varshanea. This is a pretty cool periodic table, but don't be intimidated by it. The important detail is that it breaks up the oxides into specific groups. Let's start with the first three that are over here. These are our glass formers, silica, alumina, and boron which are all glass formers. Now, boron's not going to come up today. We just want to talk about silica and alumina. We don't care what color it is, what temperature it is, or what texture it has. You're looking at silica and alumina when you look at a glaze. They make up anywhere between 60 to 90% of a glaze composition. Everything else is just adding to make silica and alumina work, for lack of a better term. Silicon alumina make up the glass, of 
course, as we said, we need to get those melting temperatures down because silica melts at cone 32 and aluminum melts at 42. Our kilns don't go that high. So we need to turn to the fluxes. Well, our fluxes are all here on the periodic table and they're right over here on the left-hand side. Your, sorry, it's your right-hand side, <laughs> a little backwards. Well, our fluxes, they fall into two columns. The first column is called the alkali metals, and that's the first column on the periodic table. They, it says alkali metals right here at the top, specifically they're lithium, sodium, and potassium. Those are all grouped together because they do all the basic same thing. The second type of flux is in the second column of the periodic table. These are magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and zinc. Zinc is not in that column, but it does behave like a flux. It's an alkali earth flux. So these two columns are called the alkali metals and the alkali earths. Each glaze has both fluxes in them. I don't care which glaze it is, what temperature it is, every single glaze in the world has both fluxes in them. Our glaze is no different. We had nepheline cyanide bring in our alkali metal, specifically sodium and potassium. We have whiting bring in alkali earth, specifically calcium. So we have our two fluxes and every glaze has two fluxes. And that's what all of our glazes are composed of. Every glaze in the world is composed of silica, alumina, and these two fluxes. Of course, we know that we have some extra things that come into play. And those are colorants. These colorants come from the central section of the periodic table. They're right here in what we call the transition metals. Well, as two groups, they're always, along with two groups, as they always get pushed down to the bottom, the lanthanides and the actinides. But colors all come from here. In fact, not all of our colors, all the colors in the world come from here. In ceramics, ours, even more importantly, are from the very first row of the transition metals. Oh good, I got that lined up. <laughs> we're going to take a look at several of them today. Specifically, we're looking at titanium, chromium, manganese, cobalt, nickel, and copper. We're also going to go throw tin in there. Tin is not quite a colorant, but it's important to the discussion today. So some colorants that you may have come across that theori theoretically you can use in ceramics are other things like vanadium or cadmium. And there's also some that are buried down in the lanthanides and actinides. And there's one big colorant that you will notice not highlighted there. It's the biggest conversation of, of them all, and that's iron. Um, we are not going to talk about iron because the chemistry behind iron is very complicated and its own talk all by itself. So be on the lookout for that. Um, we'll certainly talk about that in the future, but for now we're going to focus on titanium, chromium, manganese, cobalt, nickel, copper, and tin. So before we get to the colorants, before we get to the pretty part, we have to come back to talk about our glaze and how it works. The most important concept of glaze chemistry is this thing right here. This is Stoll's glaze map. Stoll's glaze map is the most important document of all glaze chemistry because this is a map that predicts exactly what a glaze is going to do. This map is always right. It's a really powerful tool, and we highly recommend that everyone uses it. But for now, the most important thing you're gonna learn from the map is pretty basic. As we go along the x-axis, we have silica, one of our glass formers. We start on the left-hand side at zero silica, and then we increase silica in molecular units that we won't go into right now, but we just understand that we go from zero silica to a bunch of silica. On the y-axis, we have alumina, and we go from zero alumina up to one. What this map is showing is that every combination of silica and alumina tells us this glaze is going to do. So it's gonna say where our glaze is gonna fall. So if we take our glaze and we convert it into its underlying chemistry, the map is going to tell us this, what this glaze will do chemically. It's a really powerful tool because what that means is that we can predict a glaze's behavior before we even fire it. 
what we get is this. We increase silica, and we increase alumina, and we can see in the middle here, there are several sections of the map. We've got bright, underfired, semi-matte, unfused, all sorts of different things. So let's take a look at a different version. This is actually Stull's original map as he drew it in 1912. It's broken down into several sections, and these sections are really important. The first section here is in the middle that says bright. Bright, it means glossy. It's just the term that he used when he drew this map. But what it means is if you plot the underlying chemistry of your glaze, it'll fall in the bright section. It's going to be glossy. The one behind that says semi-matte, and it's <clears throat> the one behind that says matte. And what we're saying is if your glaze falls into these section, it's going to be matte every time. This is a true matte glaze. This is a glaze where crystals grow inside the glass. These matte glazes do not rely on any special cooling or anything at all. If the glaze falls in the matte section, it will always go matte every time. So that's really important, keep that in mind. Now, how do we predict what's going to be matte and glossy? We have to look at another one of these features. But before we do that, there's two other sections, and that's deep vitrified and unfused. These both mean underfired. So this is something that's not quite right when he wrote this map. But we've seen through microscopy that both these regions are underfired. There's just too much silica and too much alumina to melt. Now, back to determining between matte and gloss. One of the interesting features of the map is the contrast between silica and alumina levels. We can see we have more silica or less silica moving left and right. Well, we can count the number of atoms of silica and we can count the number of ad alumina silicas, <clears throat> or sorry, alumina atoms. And we can find some really interesting behaviors. The first one in, on this is this line, the seven silica for every one alumina. This means that every time we have seven silica, if the glaze falls on this line, we know it has one alum alumina atom paired with it. This is really important because if you notice, it tracks pretty much in line with the highest gloss line, this dashed line right in the center. <clears throat> That's really important because it's essentially the chemistry for glossy glaze. If a glaze falls on this line, it's going to be glossy. What's more interesting is this. This is a five to one. And at five to one silica to alumina, we fall exactly over the matte, semi-matte line. And that's super important because this is the distinction. If a glaze is on one side, let's say it's four to one, the glaze is going to be matte. Let's say if it's on the other side, it's a seven to one, it's going to be glossy. If a glaze falls on either sides of these regions, what we show, we can predict whether the glaze will be glossy or matte. But you don't have to believe me. Let's take a look. So here's our 4, 3, 2, 1 formula. We have 40% nephsi, 20% whiting, 30% flint, and 10% EBK. This glaze has an 8 to 1 silica to alumina ratio, and that's a really important number. What that means is that it falls exactly here on the map. Now, it's not 7 to 1, but it is in the bright or glossy section. And so when we actually make this glaze, it's a nice gloss. It works just fine. It's doing exactly what we thought it should do. It's predicted being glossy, and it's glossy. Now we can contra contrast by this formula. This is essentially the same glaze, but we remove the excess silica. Now we have less total silica, and what that means is our silica to alumina ratio goes down. There's less silica, so the ratio goes down. Well, on this map, it's a four to one. It's predicted to be a matte glaze. We now fall inside this matte section. And when we look at the actual tile, it's a lovely buttery matte glaze. It's doing exactly what it should. So we know this concept of chemistry holds really tight. 
there's a large conversation to be had about how the fluxes influence these glazes, but understand the map holds. It doesn't matter which fluxes you pick, as long as you have two of them, you're going to get the performance of the map as it states. Now, let's look at our formula and start to consider the colorants. We have to remember that we have four basic materials. We have our alkali earth fluxes providing lithium, sodium, or potassium. We have our alkali earth fluxes providing magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, or zinc. We have flint, which is essentially a pure form of silica. We have EPK, which is a clay, which brings a concentrated source of alumina. These are four basic ingredients of silica, alumina, and two fluxes. When we talk about the greater concept of glaze chemistry, we have to consider where do colorants fall, because these four ingredients are all that we need to make a glaze. That's all it takes, but we know that the colorants play some role in the chemical performance of a glaze. It's not just the colorant. So we started a thought experiment, and we said, theoretically, the colorant has to fall into one of these groups. It has to be one of these elements because these are the types of elements that make up a glaze. So what we did in this thought experiment is we made four different glazes. Each time, we're going to include our cobalt in one of these four groups. So to say, we have one where we include cobalt carbonate in with our alkali metal flux, one where we do a second glaze where we include it with the alkali earth fluxes. And we'll do a third where it's silica and a fourth where it's alumina. And when we see, and then we'll see if this glaze matches our expectations. Now, what I mean by this is here are the actual formulas that we started off with. In these glazes on the top, what you'll see is we've got Nefsi whiting, there's no added flint in this glaze, EPK, and then cobalt carbonate. From a chemistry perspective, what we just did is we added silica and cobalt together. We made a glaze that's predicted to be a matte glaze. It falls into the matte region of the map. The next one is that we have included our cobalt with the alumina calculations on the map, and theoretically along the y-axis, the vertical axis, the glaze we've got, Nefsi, Whiting, Flynn, EPK, and cobalt carbonate. It's predicted to have a 4.5 to 1 silica alumina ratio, so it should be inside the matte section of the map if the chemistry holds. The next section, we're now using cobalt as our alkali metal flux. Now, note, there's no nephsi in this glaze. This glaze, we only have cobalt carbonate, whiting, flint, EPK, and a little bit of calcine kaolin. Now, this kaolin's in there, and calcine kaolin's just a clay that's been fired. We added that so we didn't get too much shrinkage in this glaze. But notice there's no alkaline metal. There's no lithium, there's no sodium, there's no potassium. This glaze is only flux with cobalt and calcium. In the final one, again, we have our 4.5 to 1 silica alumina ratio, but in this glaze, there's no alkali earths. All we have are nephsi, or alkaline metal, and then cobalt carbonate. So now when we're assuming that cobalt is functioning as our alkali <coughs> earth flux, so we actually batched up these glazes. We actually made them and to see what they would do. And we didn't just do matte glazes. We also made a glaze that should be glossy using the same concept. So we've got one set here that should be matte and one glossy, assuming that the cobalt is functioning like silica or functioning like alumina or functioning like our alkali metal flux or our alkali earth flux. So this is what we got. This is pretty interesting. Now, let's be clear. Each one of these sets, if they work, should have a matte glaze and a gloss glaze. We'll start in the upper, or upper right-hand corner. Left, left. Um, this is our test with silica. And we, and we assume, again, this is just a projection, that, sil that cobalt is functioning as silica. This glaze here should be matte. The, the first one should be matte. And this glaze, the second one, should be glossy. Well, that didn't work. 
So that's probably not how we're going to categorize cobalt. Our next set here on the right is cobalt as alumina. One of these should be matte and one should be glossy. Well, you can see that they're both pretty glossy. So we're probably not going to categorize cobalt as alumina. Um, when we talk about cobalt as an alkali metal flux, we get the two samples on the bottom there. And they're pr one's predicted to be matte, and it's coming out matte. And there's one that's predicted as being glossy. You'll notice it's coming out glossy. So that's indicative that cobalt is def definitely a flux, and it may be an alkali metal flux. This case here, we've got cobalt as an alkali earth flux. The matte glaze is matte and the glossy glaze is glossy. But what you'll notice is that the, there's these little specks. And that's because the glaze is crystallizing, which is actually quite a big deal. Now, for some underlying chemical, chemical reasons that we don't have time to go into today, we decided that cobalt is functioning as an alkali earth flux. It's falling into this group with magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, zinc, and now cobalt. We're pretty happy with that. So, so then what we did, we went back and <clears throat> did all these glaze chemistry and we included cobalt as our alkali earth flux. Then we asked, where do these glazes fall on the map? If we're assuming that cobalt is in these glazes as an alkali earth flux, this is what we found. Those two silica samples both fall into the matte region. <clears throat> and then the alumina samples fall into the gloss section, and they're both glossy. But the alkali metal and the alkali earth glazes fall in the matte section and the gloss section. So that really leads to verifier prediction. All of the chemi chemistry that we assumed would be there is in fact working. So this is really indicative that this projection is true. As we said, we're working with the assumption that some of the chemical background, that cobalt, is actually working as an alkali earth flux. So then we decide to go back and recreate a line on Stull's map. And this is where we go from left to right, and we see that the, what the glaze will do. Because if chemical prediction is true, we should follow the behavior of the map. We can see that the red dots, that the glaze starts in the matte section and continues on as matte until it transitions into the glossy section, and then it'll eventually go under fired. Looking at our samples, that's exactly what we have. It starts as a matte, it transitions into gloss, eventually it starts to lose its sheen and become under fired. It is replicating what the map says it should, adding validity to this concept. Now, this has become a pretty powerful tool because now we know that if, now we know what the chemistry of this glaze is, we can begin to incorporate cobalt in as an alkali earth flux. There's no longer magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, or zinc. It's magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, zinc, and cobalt. So now we've been able to take this idea and play with this chemistry and use it as an alkali earth to our advantage. And this is some of the cool stuff that we've come up with. This is some work by our research associate, TC. I believe he's in the room. And we, he's been doing a lot of this work. He's on Instagram under Cone Infinity. Um, and he's been posting a lot of this work. And these are cobalt crystalline glazes. These are crystalline glazes influenced by the alkali earth. Well, in this case, it's cobalt. So we now have cobalt crystalline glazes. We're taking advantage of understanding the chemistry to make the glaze do what we wanted validating this concept. So the next colorant we profiled is manganese. We won't go through all the steps of profiling the chemistry, but we follow the same steps. <clears throat> and this is a line on Stull. And these two lines, um, they both match behavior that we largely expected. This is the upper line. We can see it starts in the matte section, and this glaze is matte, and then it transitions into into gloss, but we can see one and two fall into the matte section. <clears throat> the glaze goes glossy for a stretch and then it goes back. Sorry, I just lost my place there. Um, 
So those first two samples are kind of glossy. So it doesn't quite fit the map, but we believe there are some shifts on how the map functions depending on what flux is used. And that's work that we've done before with materials such as barium and strontium. So we're pretty comfortable with the concept. So both these lines start in the matte region, go glossy, and then go under fired. So this lower line, this is at a lower alumina level. And we can see one and two are highly matte. The middle section is glossy, but it's crystalline, much like we made the, the cobalt crystalline glazes. Then the glaze goes under fired as we add more silicon alumina to it. So the theory is holding. In fact, this is work started a long time ago by Grant Akiyama, who was the, one of the first students who ever did any work on this. He actually created a very large portion of Stoll's map using just manganese. It worked just fine. Now, these are purely conceptual glazes. We are not recommending that um, you use these for functional wear. They have a lot of color in them. Uh, so use them at your own caution, please. The list continues with the consideration that the alkali metal fluxes is now magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, zinc, cobalt, and now manganese. So not all our glazes function as earth or alkali earth fluxes. We went and did all the testing. And we won't go through it today because it's a lot. Um, but we also tested copper. And what we found is that copper functions as an alkali metal flux. This is a series of glazes fluxed only with copper and calcium in them. Again, we need one flux from both groups. In this case, we found copper function as an alkali metal flux. And again, we can see we've got matte glazes that transition quickly into glossy glazes as they jump over that line and then they become under fired matching exactly what we're hoping from the prediction of Stull. And this work has been predated also by a student of ours, Kiara Matos. She presented this last year at NSICA. Kiara also made a full map with copper as an alkaline metal flux. Everything on this map is just copper carbonate, whiting, flint, and EPK, stating that the trends of the map hold exactly the same. The purple lines here are the matte gloss lines, and you can see that the glazes fall on either side of it, matte on one side, gloss on the other. On the other side, the red line is under fired. There are some shifts to where that falls, but the trend of the map still holds, really validating our theory. The next one is tin. This work was assisted by Veronica Montavan, our student in Italy. Tin is the one colorant that's not in the transition metals. Tin is largely not a colorant per se, but tin is what we call an opacifier, which means it's been added to a glaze to make a glaze white. So our samples don't show too much, they're just white. Please ignore the blue, that's not a result of the tin, that's a result of my husband's dirty fingers loading the kiln. <laughs> But again, we see that matte, there's matte glazes, glossy glazes, into underfired. And we can tell they're underfired because these little nubs on the side, that's actually glazed that didn't melt. But they're largely following the rules of stull. Now, this is why something like this is so important. This is a series of chrome tin reds that we made. These are cone 10 oxidation reds. And these are chrome tins, and tin is a major component of these glazes. In fact, it's 5% tin by weight. Well, in this grid, here it falls on Stull's map. If we are not considering tin as an alkali metal flux, which we believe it is, the problem is that you can see that there's this large section in the corner of the map on your right, left, sorry. I'm a lefty, I get things backwards. Um, so the problem is you'll see that that corner in the, that falls on the map is actually in the matte section. Well, these glazes are not matte, they're pretty glossy. <clears throat> Leading us to believe that tin is really not functioning as an alkali metal flux. But in this blue square, here it is predicting tin as an alkali metal flux. 
This is what it does when it moves most of the glazes out of the matte region. So this is tin included in the chemistry of this glaze. Um, and this is what we largely see, that they're all highly glossy. It's giving us a lot of comfort to this theory. And there's some greater concepts about the silica to alumina level, which we can talk about privately. But this glaze is also puts our alumina level under 0.35, which is really important, but that's another discussion for another time. So, not all colorants are the same, though. There are colorants out there that are not necessarily believed to behave like fluxes. Those, col those colorants tend to behave very differently because not all of them can be assumed to be fluxes, specifically two which tend to be very different, which are nickel and titanium. They don't seem to flux a glaze at all. On top of that, they have a very bizarre behavior. That is, if you have enough nickel or titanium as your colorant, they tend to make the glaze crystallize. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we consider these? If they're not fluxes, where do we group them? We propose that is our position right now, but we're fairly comfortable with it, that they should be grouped with alumina when looking at the glaze chemistry. Now, what we mean is this. Well, here's a series that we did with our student, Vanessa A. Zone. She's one of our students at Harvard Ceramics. And this is a test is going to start with the same four, three, two, one base that we looked at. It's here on the map, being nice and glossy. So we're going to take a look at series of glazes and each time we're going to add 1% increments of titanium dioxide. So this is 1% in the glaze, it's still glossy, it's doing exactly where it should according to the map. This is 2% titanium and the glaze continues to be glossy. Yes, it picks up a little bit of a haze on the edge. We call this phase separation and this is pretty common with titanium. What's really interesting, as we go to 3% titanium, the glaze gets a little more yellow tan, a little bit more phase separation. Remember, we're assuming that we're adding titanium in case of alumina. So from a map perspective, we're going up. At 4%, it's getting more yellow, more haze. At 5%, things get pretty interesting. Now we've got more yellow, more haze, but now We've got these little white specks that emerge in the glaze. This is only interesting because of 6%. This is 6%. Of course, this is fascinating because it's crystallizing. It's pretty amazing. More importantly, if we're accounting for titanium as alumina, or in the alumina family, we're now literally on the glossy semi-matte line. We've crossed that line exactly, and now the glaze is crystallizing. Remember, that's what a true matte glaze is. It's crystals inside of a glass. So then 8%, 9%, and 10%. And the glaze just continues to crystallize the further we move up into the matte region. Now, there's a lot to discuss with titanium. There are amounts, there's cooling cycles, there are a lot of these variables to consider. We've looked at them all. And what we did, we did a thin application with a natural cool, so to say the, cool, the kiln fired up, we just let it cool naturally. We did longer dips with natural cool. We have tested cool or slow cooling, but again, the same thing happens at 6%. We've got to divide, and at over 6%, the glaze becomes a completely different beast. This is with assuming that the glaze is functioning as alumina. A very interesting trend, and it gives us some validity to this notion that it should be grouped with alumina. Now, we don't mean that it can be used in substitution for alumina. We're just saying that we can predict what titanium is going to do in our glaze. From a prediction standpoint, we are liking this notion that titanium should be grouped with alumina. The next material, oh gosh, I'm sorry. This is our slow cooling dipping. I'm sorry, I'm a little slide behind. This is nickel, I should look up more often. 
Nickel is essentially doing the same thing with a slightly different concentration. At 0%, the glaze is glossy. As we add 1% increments of nickel, the glaze continues to be glossy, but we can start to see these little crystallization specks. And at 8% here, 0.9 on the map, we can see the glaze is very speckly, but it's still glossy. The interesting transition is then the final test at 9%. At 9%, this point here is crossed into the matte region of the map, and it's definitely a different glaze. It's not just crystallized a little, it's now changed its color, it's got a solid matte surface, it's completely and utterly crystallized. These are all the same firing. They're just adding extra nickel carbonate into the glaze. Now, to add to the conversation about slow cool versus fast cool, these are exactly the same glazes that we dipped, just two different tiles, and we did one in a natural cool and one in a slow cool. So the top line is the natural cool, that's the first line that we already looked at. The really important thing here is because what we can see is that the glaze, it continues to be glossy, even with the slow cool. But the crystals are there, it's, they're just larger. Um, and that's the important distinction, is when we crossed into the matte line, when considering nickel like alumina, all of a sudden the glaze goes completely and utterly matte is completely following the rules of Stull, as we predicted based on this type of behavior, some pretty cool behavior. And it leads us to believe that this idea that titanium and nickel function as a category with alumina. Of course, there's some materials that don't follow any rules. Specifically, we have to talk about chrome oxide. Chrome is much trickier because it's not a flux. And if you've ever worked with chrome, that you know that will dry your glaze up is the way it's usually described. And that's a condition of being refractory, also an anti-flux. It doesn't make glazes go matte or crystallize, so it really becomes a difficult question. If we can predict titanium and nickel because they follow the rules of alumina when we put it on the map, but chrome doesn't follow any of these rules. So, here's a series with chrome. Again, starting with our 4321 base. At 0%, it's pretty glossy, and there are 1% increments by weight, all the way up to 19% chrome by weight. The interesting thing is of this, that we go up all the way to 9%, the glaze is actually fairly glossy. It continues to hold its gloss. Even all the way up to 19%, the glaze is underfired, to be sure, because it's got 19% chrome, but it still has a glossy sheen. It never crystallizes like titanium or nickel. So, to say, we can't assume that it works like alumina. It doesn't have that behavior. It never crosses into the matte region. So you can see that line if we if we track it as alumina, it goes up into the matte region. So if we try to assume that it would be like alumina, it should start crystallizing probably here at about four to five percent. It never does, it just stays glossy. So to us, it means that it's probably not true. So we could say the same thing about silica. The glaze definitely, uh, it, does definitely dry up as we go to the higher amounts. But under this prediction, as we assume that this is silica, chrome as silica, it should dry out between 13 and 14%. We can see 13, 12, 11, 10, 9% even. They're definitely not as glossy as they should be. So we're not really comfortable with that standpoint. What we're really proposing at this point that we really think that there's more likely chrome should be categorized in conjunction with silica and alumina. That's because for some fairly complicated reasoning that has to do with the map, that as we move up the map in this diagonal direction, you see here, we're essentially making glazes that should be fired at a higher temperature. So to say, if we take this number 19 here and fire it to say cone 14 instead of 10, it probably would melt just fine. 
But since the chrome is refractory, it's not allowing our glaze to do that. Now, chrome generally is not a high percentage colorant in most of our glazes. It's not that much of an effect. In fact, finding chrome glazes with more than two to 4% is pretty rare. One or 2% chrome is all we usually see in glazes. So it's really negligible as far as a colorant. It is refractory, it does have an effect on overall chemistry, and we think it does need some sort of character categorization at this point, which is why it's categorized as a cumulative shift of both silica and alumina, keeping the performance of the glaze still in the glossy section, but moving up along the map. So there's this question of the future. As we said, the big one would be iron. That's going to be its own topic um, here at Enseca. We're not sure when, but that's a big discussion to be had. But before we do have here, um, we had two of our students, TC Stanton and Nick Waddell, two of our students. They asked right before we finished this presentation, what about the rare earth elements, specifically neodymium? We took advantage to make one more set using these same rules that we set up with the cobalt <clears throat> before we set this presentation in. This is the same profiling with neodymium. The top row versus the bottom row is just the front and the back of the same tile. What we see is that this is neodymium as silica for a matte glaze, as silica for a gloss glaze, as alumina for a matte glaze, as alumina for a gloss, as alkaline metal for a matte, as an alkaline metal for a gloss and as an alkali earth for a matte and alkali earth for gloss. So to say, we're pretty happy with this concept of it being an alkali metal flux, but we need, to be, we need to do more testing to take this any further. But pretty neat that rare earth elements even follow this concept. So in conclusion, we would like to put forward this notion to the community, we encourage you to go test and confirm and deny and challenge and help set these definitions in chemistry. Um, we really do think going forward is that cobalt and manganese will be functioning as an alkali earth flux. Copper and tin function as an alkali metal flux with possibly neodymium. Where titanium and nickel should be grouped with alumina as far as predicting chemical behavior. Well, chrome is going to be an independent material with silica and alumina for its effects on temperature, but not its chemistry. So, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Is it I really appreciate you staying and, and uh, listening to my uh, crazy theories here. So I will take any questions if you have them. It's a of lot. Of course, John. Hi. Um, I would like to propose a slightly different approach to chromium. It is not soluble. It's not going into solution. It's a separate phase in the glaze. And that, that sort of folds into it being considered a refractory. Uh -huh. um, I don't know that most glazes will dissolve more than a quarter to a half a percent of chromium. Whereas co cobalt, you can dissolve many percent of cobalt into a glaze. And so you see it behaving like other things that dissolve. Chromium does not dissolve, and it's just a separate phase. So it's a, it's a, it's a beast animal. all to its own. Chrome is a difficult one. Yeah. And I don't know the melting point of chrome oxide itself, but it's probably up there. Yes. Thank you, John. Hi, Rose. Hi, Grant. What a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a real treat, truly. I was just curious if you will ever consider publishing a UMF calculator that takes these colorants uh, into consideration as they're presently theorized to be. Yes, we do have um, a calculator, but it's totally experimental right now. Okay. Um, we, we do have a glaze calculator that you can use. Some of the formulas that we put in there um, is on our website um, at ceramicmaterialsworkshop.com. And, uh, and Matt will publish these for us. So 
you guys can take a look at the website. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I was just talking to you, but uh, this is a great talk. Thank you. Um, I've been trying to beat my head through glass structure things for a very long time, and I'm wondering if you've talked to anybody that's, you know, a real glass scientist, not that you aren't, but that, that talks about the structure of glasses and how they work with this theory, and if there's any place where it really does match up. That's an interesting theory. I, I don't know if there's matched up. We haven't talked to any glass scientists yet, but... Oh, you did? So he did talk. There we go. He knows a little bit more than I do. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. It's very interesting. I was wondering how you're considering oxidation versus reduction when you're doing the firings? Uh. Well, these are all oxidation. Okay. These are all cone 10 oxidation. Um, reduction certainly does play a role in how glazes function sometimes, but we, were, we don't have capabilities right now to do reduction, otherwise we would have tried. Okay. But that's something to consider for a future project. Maybe Matt can present that. Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. You're a wonderful audience for my first time.